The heart of ancient Athens was the Acropolis, standing above the city like a great stage on which was played the drama of humanity 3,000 years ago. These are the ruins of a once glorious civilization. Symbolized in this once magnificent structure, the Parthenon, Temple of Athena, the Greek goddess of wisdom. In the past, these ruins have always drawn the lovers of classical art, history, and archaeology. But today, they are a magnet for the ordinary traveler. You need not be a scholar to feel and appreciate the meaning and beauty of ancient Greece. In the time of its greatest glory, when the Parthenon and these other temples of the gods and goddesses were still new, Athens was no bigger than only a fair-sized city. Yet within sight of these stone maidens, there lived a group of philosophers, writers, and artists who changed the world forever. Plato, Aristotle, Pericles, Socrates, and many more. The giants of human thought and achievement who were Athenians in those days. But Athens alone was not Greece, then or now. To the north lay Delphi, city of the Oracle, holiest place in ancient Greece. Here was its theater stage. And this is what still stands of the great temple of Apollo, sacred seat of the oracle. To the ancient Greeks, it was the fountainhead of all wisdom, and inscribed here was the wisest of Greek maxims, know thyself. The waters of this spring purified the high priestess of prophecy. These columns in Delphi form one of the finest remains of all antiquity. Originally built in 490 B.C., this temple was reconstructed in 1904. On one side of today's Corinth Canal is the Greek mainland. On the other side, the Peloponnesus, site of ancient Sparta and Corinth, rivals of Athens in commerce and war, until the Romans arrived in 145 B.C. to conquer all of Greece. This is part of the rebuilt Roman Greek city of Corinth. Here in Mycenae, you will recall Homer's story of the Trojan War. How it took King Agamemnon 10 years to sail from Troy, home to his wife, Queen Cytomenstra in Mycenae. This passageway once led to a treasure trove of that time. Here were found the tombs of Agamemnon and Cytomenstra. The entrance to the burial chamber was guarded by these lions, whose paws rest on what was once a sacred altar. If you know nothing else about ancient Greece, you certainly know the word Olympics and what it stands for. Here is where it all began, at Olympia in 776 B.C. to honor the Greek god Zeus and his wife Hera, to whom these temples were dedicated. As you look at these remains of Greek history and mythology, remember that musicians and artists, as well as athletes, competed in the original Olympics, including the Emperor Nero, who came here from Rome and, it is said, won the chariot race and the singing contest. The ancient Greeks were ardent theater lovers, and here at Epidaurus is probably the best preserved classical theater in the country, seating 14,000 people. College girls, drama students, no doubt, come to pay honor to the art of the Greek theater. Ask them to name the world's five greatest playwrights, and four will be Greeks, whose plays were performed in this theater. First, Shakespeare. Then Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, and Aristophanes. With the two college girls, 
we are attending the performance of a classical Greek play in Epidaurus. <laughs> We have returned to the 20th century to see what history has done to the glory that was Greece. Our modern odyssey starts with Athens, measured against the background of classical antiquity. A lot to live up to. Your first panoramic view of Athens today shows you a big city, a metropolis really and very much in the swing of things like London, Paris, New York, and Rome. This is downtown Athens. And here is where you rub elbows with contemporary city Greeks who do not seem unduly burdened by or even conscious of their great historical heritage. Here is a Greek bearing gifts. If you're lucky, he's your friend, the lottery man. Street merchants offer everything from nuts and yogurt to get your picture taken in five minutes. Also, a pair of beatniks, American style, and a Greek sponge vendor. Sprinkled throughout the city, you'll find establishments like this. Here is the well-stocked kiosk, selling souvenirs and postcards to tourists and the daily newspaper to the true Athenian. For a city of a million and a half people, Athens has plenty of sidewalk cafes. Here, the sociable Athenians spend hours over a cup of coffee. The well-traveled observer will say, ah, Piazza San Marco, Venice. But no, these are Greek pigeons and their friends in a park area of Athens. The tradition of the fine arts is a heritage that remains alive in contemporary Athens as ornament to the academies of education and government. These buildings in the classical mode attest to the political stability of Greece today under a constitutional monarchy. The Archaeological Museum, a treasure house of Greek antiquity. Facing Constitution Square is the Greek Parliament, once residence of the king. The ceremony we are about to witness is in the modern military tradition, changing of the guard at the tomb of the unknown soldier. It is a solemn occasion, its participants from the military and naval establishments of Greece. The change of guard accomplished, with two army guards deployed to duty, two navy men relieved of duty. Zone costume, without doubt the world's most picturesque military uniform, deserves a word of explanation. It is derived from a fierce band of Greek mountaineers who fought heroically in the War of Independence and other Greek wars. Today, the Evzone Regiment forms the elite guard of the royal household. In France, Bastille Day is celebrated on the 5th of July. In the United States, Independence Day, the 4th of July. Here in Athens and throughout Greece, Independence Day is celebrated with military parades and pageantry on the 25th of March, Day of Freedom. Any time is sailing time in Greece. And from this dock, you take your choice of boats 
for a blue holiday cruise to the many Aegean islands that have always been a vital part of Greece, ancient and modern. Behind us is the city of Athens. Ahead of us is the island of Hydra. And below us are the vacationists en route. Great names of Greek mythology once sailed these waters. Ulysses, Agamemnon, Achilles, the god Apollo. The harbor of the island of Hydra. At one time, it was an important naval center in the Greek war against the Turks. Today, Hydra is more a tourist attraction than anything else, with fishing as its next best source of revenue. Incidentally, Hydra is also the site of a colony of writers and painters. Nobody is in a hurry on this sunny island, which is also true of all Greek islands in the Aegean. The word for Hydra is picturesque, or scenery and people, like these fishermen, a sturdy breed of men. We are now entering the harbor of Mykonos, a popular summer resort for Athenians and a stopover point for foreign visitors who make the regular cruise of the central Aegean islands. Here's a child's eye view of the harbor from an island hill. Aside from the people of Mykonos, what impresses visitors most are the houses you see here always pure white, as though freshly whitewashed this morning, which is quite likely. Fishing is the main occupation. Meet the pride and joy of Mykonos, Pedro the Pelican, which sounds like a Disney cartoon character, but is a live and friendly bird, as you can see. The fishermen have made a special pet of Pedro, regarding him, or her, as a good luck charm for the fishing boats of Mykonos. As you see, Pedro has also become the pet of tourists on the island. Notice the churches of Mykonos. Like the houses, they are built in the form of cubes and are pure white. Wherever you go, you see the same motif in architecture and color, or rather, the absence of color in the building. The windmills of Mykonos are quite unusual and make excellent subjects for your camera. Notice the thatched roof and strange sail, like on boats. After a walk around the town, which includes climbing of steep hills, it is a pleasure to sit for a while over coffee and cake and to watch a very strange performance. This is not exactly a traditional folk dance, but a very special talent by an enterprising young man. It is an exhibition of strength, skill, and grace. Holiday sailing weather in Greece's wonderful blue Mediterranean is close to perfection. We have crossed over to Delos, the most important island of Greek antiquity. Ruins look pretty much alike, no matter where you find them. But what makes the difference is the story behind stones and columns and the people involved, the great men of Greece, or the gods and goddesses of Greek mythology. Here, for instance, these stone lions, guardians of the sanctuary of the god Apollo.
In the sacred lake area, your guide will uncover the mosaics of Delos. Once used merely as pavements, today they are shown as works of art. The mosaics you see today in Rome and Pompeii, at Westminster Abbey in London, at the Stockholm Town Hall, are modeled after the pavement mosaics of Delos. We have come to the island of Rhodes at the eastern end of the Mediterranean. Today, a modest deer stands where once the Colossus of Rhodes stood astride this harbor. The view across the harbor to the great castle makes excellent composition for picture taking, as indeed does the castle itself. But it is the old walled town that is worth exploring at your leisure. This is the Street of Knights, meaning the Byzantine Knights of Rhodes, of the Order of St. John of Jerusalem. Now we're in the Turkish part of the city. The Turks, who are Muslims of course, captured Rhodes in 1522. We have come along the coast to the ancient city of Lindos, with its great castle of the Knights. With these ancient ruins goes an accompanying story about the 48 daughters of Danaos, who murdered their husbands and were condemned by the angry gods to the hopeless job of trying to empty the sea with a sieve. On our way back to the Greek mainland, we have stopped at the island of Crete in the middle of the Mediterranean. Crete, part of Greece, goes back some 5,000 years to King Minos, which makes Crete the cradle of European civilization. Few of its native inhabitants know much about it. And the chances are that they wouldn't be much impressed if you were to tell them that they are descendants of men who brought civilization out of Egypt to Europe. That their ancestors founded Athens and left a great heritage of fine art and philosophy to the world they live in today. have not changed much on Crete. The women preserve the ways of their mothers and seem quite content with things as they are. As you smell that bread and watch the women of Crete at work, you feel that time here has stood still, at least for the past century or two, what you might call the old-fashioned way of life. Not ancient, but certainly not mid-20th century in its way of doing things which might be just as well if you prefer the personal touch rather than the mass production method of manufacture. Somehow this way seems to suit these ladies very nicely. What better way to pass the time of day than working and talking with village friends and neighbors? This wonderful vista leads us back to ancient ruins again, but with a difference, the climax of Greek antiquity. Because here at Knossos in the 1870s, a long forgotten civilization was unearthed by the British archeologist, Sir Arthur Evans. The forecourt is not much more than rubble and blocks. On these ancient walls, you see magnificent frescoes and murals done by artists who lived many centuries before such work was being done on the European continent. Off the northwest coast of Greece lies the island of Corfu, whose history, besides Greek, is British, French, German, Italian, and even Russian. Today, as for the past hundred years, Corfu is entirely Greek. 
On the main square of the city stands the elegant colonnades of the former royal palace. Today, an archaeological museum. We cannot end our Greek odyssey without another look at the art of the dance in Greece. You realize at once, of course, that this dance is nothing like the Greek dance you saw previously in this film. That was the dance of the waterfront, the tavern, and the working man. What we see here is more in the tradition of the Greek folk dance, of peasants and highborn alike. More staid and stately, so respectable that even royalty has been known to participate. The journey of mankind from unrecorded history into modern times, the epic of Athens was one of humanity's happiest days in the calendar of man's existence. In the chronology of time, that era was 500 years before the birth of Christ, the golden age of Pericles, uncrowned king of Athens. In his lifetime, within the boundaries of his small city, lived men whose works fill our libraries today our halls of medicine, our theaters, our universities, men who gave the world the concept of democracy. All of these and many more are summed up for us today in these noble stones of the Acropolis, crowned by its Parthenon, a shining citadel of intellect, a symbol of all that is great and true in the emergence of man as master of the world he lives in. Mm -hmm.